I'm glad it all, all the timing worked out. Thank you. I know. And both were like, yeah, we can work together. Can you turn it off? Good afternoon, everyone. I'll let for a few more people to find a seat. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Freeman Speaker Series. Um, again, my name is Norbert Wilson. I'm a faculty member here in the Freeman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy. It is uh, a great pleasure to have all of you here. Um, today's speaker, Leah Pinneman, um, is one that uh, several of our students have asked uh, and uh, have requested, and, and so we were finally able to make it work out, and so we're grateful for that. Um, a little bit of background, uh, Leah Pinneman is a black Creole educator, a farmer, author, and food justice activist from Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York. She co-founded Soul Fire Farm in 2011 with the mission to end racism in the food system and reclaim our ancestral connection to land. As co-executive director, Leah is part of a team that facilitates powerful food sovereignty programs, including farmer in training, farmer training for black and brown people, a subsidized farm food distribution program for communities living under food apartheid, and domestic and international organizing uh, toward equity in the food system. Leah has been farming since 1996, and she holds a Master of uh, Arts in Science Education and a BA in Environmental Science and, Inter and International Development from Clark University, and is a uh, queen mother in Vodun. The work of Leah and Soul Fire Farm has been recognized by the Soros Racial Justice Fellowship, the Fulbright Program, GRIS 50, and the James, and the James Beard Award among others. Her book, Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farms, Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land, is a love song for the land and for her people. Let's thank and present Leah. Peace family, thank you so much for having me. Uh, can you raise your hand if you eat food? Okay, we have a very honest group today. Uh, can you raise your hand if you live on land? Anyone live in a boat? Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for that person. So you're in the right place because all of us who eat food and all of us who live on land are part of the food system and are potential agents of change in making the food system just and fair and equitable and sustainable. And I'm really honored, thank you so much for the introduction, really, really honored to be here amongst you, the current and future leaders um, in the world of health and nutrition and food, to talk about the ways we can work together. Uh, so thank you. Anyone Haitian in the house? Any Haitian? All right, so in Haiti, when we're about to do any storytelling, there's a call and response that we do. Where the storyteller says, creak, and then everyone who wants to hear the story responds, crack. So we're gonna try that. Creak, creak, beautiful. Um, we begin by calling our ancestors. None of us got here by ourselves. All of us are here because somebody made a sacrifice for us, and we need to acknowledge that and not pretend like we made up all the good stuff that we're doing. Um, so I want to call into the room one particular ancestor of mine. Her name is Susie Boyd. She's my grandma's grandma's grandma. And she lived in the Dahomey region of West Africa in the 1700s and was kidnapped uh, by Europeans to go work, you know, without wages against her will in the United States, South Carolina particularly. But she did something really fascinating to me before um, she was snatched up. You know, she was living in terror. Cousins, uncles, brothers were being taken. She knew her time was coming. And she gathered up the millet, sorghum, cow pea, agusi melon, molokia seed that her family had been saving for generations, and she hid it in her hair, in her braids, and in the braids of her children, as insurance for the future. Um, so. 
I get discouraged a lot. I mean, I joke with my husband pretty much every fall around this time that I'm going to quit farming and go work for the post office because, like, it's just a lot. Um, but I think about Susie Boyd, and I think about the fact that she didn't give up on her descendants. So who am I in relatively uh, easy circumstances to contemplate giving up on those to come in my own generation? So I want to give you the opportunity to call in an ancestor as well. Think about somebody who metaphorically placed a seed in their hair for you. And at the count of three, we're going to call their names loud and strong. One, two, three. I say thank you. Um, I also want to pay homage and give thanks to the original friends of this land and of the land that we're on um, in Grafton, New York. We've got about 80 acres of Mohican territory that we take care of. Um, and the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican folks were forced off that land in the 1800s by colonizers to a very swampy, small, and desolate parcel in northern Wisconsin, where I've had the privilege to visit and to start to build friendships and accountability with that community and to make sure everything we do on our land is with the consent and blessing of the community who stewarded it before us. Um, here we are in Massachusetts territory, also crisscrossed by Nipmuc, Wampanoag, Narragansett, Mohegan, and I want to give thanks uh, for their stewardship of this land and also make a commitment to support their struggles. You know, indigenous people are not extinct by any means. Um, there's the Northern Woodlands Remediation Collective working right around here to bring lands back. There's Northeast Farmers of Color working to bring lands back. And if it's something that's new to you to think about, I really encourage you to get involved with the local indigenous struggle. <coughs> and my final shout out before we get into the storytelling is to my team. Right, we have this weird hero industrial complex in the movement sometimes where we think like Martin Luther King was a civil rights movement, maybe with Rosa Parks. But of course, it takes all of us to do anything worthwhile. And the only reason I can be here, you know, in clean clothes without chicken shit on my boots is because someone else has chicken shit on their boots, right? And so I really want to give a shout out to Larissa and Jonah, Leticia and Demaris and the whole team that are holding it down um, so that we can do this important work together. Will someone read this quote? I'll ask. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to take a little journey through history to try to understand how the food system got to be the way it is. And I'm going to argue that the food system is not broken at all. It's actually working the way it was designed. And it was designed with a peculiar DNA, right? How many people like science in here? Probably a lot of y'all. Okay. So I, I, was the, I studied biology, environmental science. I'm really into science. And um, I think about the food system, though, as having DNA. And the double helix with its two strands for the food system, one of them would be stolen land and the other would be exploited labor. We're going to see how that came about. So my sister made this painting to represent Susie Boyd braiding the seeds into her hair. Anyone ever get their hair braided before? Okay. What's the experience like? What do you say, painful? <laughs> painful, long. Maybe you're getting your head hit with the brush because you're squirming too much and you're tender-headed. But it does take a long time to get a style. And so what happens while you're sitting between your auntie's knees getting your style? Falcon, stories, transmission of wisdom, transmission of knowledge, right? And so I imagine Susie Boyd braiding her baby's hair and being like, child, we're in for some time, but I don't want you to forget who we are, who you are. And this includes right relationships, with the earth, with food, and with one another. Sustainable farming has a lot of techniques. A lot of times we think about them as ahistorical, things like raised beds. That comes from the Ovambo people in Namibia. Things like the collective work party, where we take turns planting each other's fields and reaping together, and we share soup and we share music, right? It comes from West Africa. It's called the Dokwe, or the Kombi. The idea of pooling our money together, like in a credit union, so that we can get the cow that we need or, or thatch the roof on our barn. That comes from women in West Africa, in the Caribbean, it's called the Susi. Things like composting. We can trace all the way back to Cleopatra in 59 BCE, who literally would have you put to death if you harmed an earthworm. Now, I don't believe in capital punishment. Get that straight. 
But I think it's fascinating that she created a law like that and a consequence like that. She had a whole cadre of priests whose full-time study was dedicated to the habits of earthworms. And in 1949, USDA scientists went over to you know, her former empire and did soil cores and found worm castings like 40 times as concentrated there as they were in uh, the Great Plains. You know, so she was like sheet composting, vermicomposting the whole empire. Really, really fascinating. Things like rotational grazing, uh, so-called permaculture, which is really rebranded stolen indigenous knowledge. Like all of this comes from our folks. And so I imagine these braids happening, right? Don't forget how to treat the soil. Don't forget how to treat the earth one. Don't forget how to treat your brothers and sisters, right? But the project of colonization, as I mentioned, is not just to steal the land and the labor, but to really try to force us to forget who we are. Okay. So marching through time, does anyone know this, this painting? You might have seen it in your U.S. history textbook. Manifest destiny. What is manifest destiny? <laughs> right, it's this, this interesting notion, right, that um, the entire continent is destined uh, to be controlled by Europeans. Um, and this idea actually started in the 1400s out of the Catholic Church. Pope Nicholas put out a papal decree in 1455 that said that white Christian nations um, had divine right to go forth, colonize, pillage, and enslave non-Christian, non-white nations. It was what was called the Doctrine of Discovery, and it became the basis for U.S. property law. Um, if anyone is a property lawyer, you'll know that in your very first course, you learn about the Macintosh case in 1823, where the Supreme Court upheld the Doctrine of Discovery, saying that indigenous people do not have rights to their land. They're domestic dependents, not sovereign. Um, and, you know, even today, even the reservations that are left for indigenous people, they're actually owned by the federal government and the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and indigenous people have the right to live there, but not to have title. Um, this idea of the Doctrine of Discovery, which is nicknamed the Finder Keeper's Law, has been upheld by the Supreme Court many, many times, most recently in 2005, when the Oneida Nation, just west of where we live, um, sued New York State and the power companies and 20,000 residents for um, their stolen lands. There was a, a treaty violation. And um, Justice Ginsburg uh, said, under the Doctrine of Discovery, you actually don't have the right to even bring, um, bring these claims. So we haven't rectified this fundamentally. This land was all taken, right? And you can't have any food without any land. The second strand of the DNA is, of course, stolen labor. Right? Um, this image here represents the 12 and a half million African agriculturalists who were kidnapped from their homeland and brought over to this continent. Um, Judith Carney's book, Black Rice, really helped to dispel, dispel a myth that I had adopted um, that people were just picked up because they had like strong biceps or you know healthy gums or something. When in fact, expert agriculturalists were taken. Uh, to establish the multi-trillion dollar agricultural industry in the U.S. And if you think about it, like, what's the climate like in Northern Europe? Cool. What's the climate like in Cuba, Georgia, Florida, Brazil? Uh, who knows how to farm that climate? <laughs> we had to go find, right? They had to go find the Mende rice farmers in order to establish the, the rice industry of the Carolinas, right? They had to go find the cattle herders to establish the cattle herding of Cuba. And so people were, um, slavers were particularly adept at finding the best farmers and, and taking them. And when I was living in Ghana um, back in 2002, I really got a picture and an understanding of what that loss of the best farmers did to the continent. So there was like really a lot of harm on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. We're all good, right? Slavery's over. We imagine, we pretend the land was given back by ignoring that history, right? But something happened um, to continue this legacy in 1865. We had the Emancipation Proclamation, we had uh, the 13th Amendment, but there was a loophole built in. Does anyone know what the loophole is in the 13th Amendment? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Slavery is outlawed um, in this country unless you're convicted of a crime. Um, I'm sure many of you watched the Ava, Ava DuVernay documentary, 13th, if you haven't. It, it goes over that really beautifully um, and tragically. But what happened after 1865 is that, you know, the South is freaking out because the labor force is uh, gone, essentially, or they imagine it will be gone. So they create a whole new set of laws called the Black Codes. And the Black Codes make it illegal 
fundamentally to exist as an African-American person. Um, laws like loitering, uh, be, loitering becomes a crime. And what does that mean? Loitering? Standing around, great. Um, being out after dark becomes a crime. Vagrancy, does anyone know that one, what that means? Vagrancy is not having a job. Um, specifically not having a year-long contract on a farm. That becomes a crime. So the prisons fill with black people, not because of you know, real harm being done to society, but because of these, uh, these black codes. And what the state does is then lease people back to the plantations, the mines, and the railroads. Um, in the late 1800s, 73% of Alabama's state budget came from leasing African-American prisoners back to plantations. So this was a very, very significant way um, that the labor, the agricultural labor was generated. Um, and recently, tragically, because of the crackdown on so-called immigration, uh, from, of so-called illegals, uh, there's a shortage, a labor shortage, in the West and the South for bringing in this year's harvest. So convict leasing is on the rise. Uh, New York Times recently covered this. So there are thousands of black men doing unpaid labor on farms in this country in 2019, right now. Uh, those who weren't uh, convict leasees were likely sharecroppers. That was the other main way that labor continued throughout the late 1800s, early 1900s. And sharecropping is a debt handed system where the plantation owner owns the mule, the house, your clothes, the tools, the seed, and then you pay it back at the end of the year through a share of your crop. And one of my favorite stories about Fannie Lou Hamer is that when she was a little girl, only six years old, she noticed that the plantation owner had fixed the scales to undervalue the cotton harvest and she went in the night and put them back. And she's like, that was the moment when I became a rebel. Um, really, really beautiful story. Something that astounds me is despite, you know, this really almost unimaginably crushing oppression of, of the black codes and convict leasing and sharecropping, is that our people's yearning for land uh, was unabated. You know, when General Sherman met with 30 black clergy members um, at the end of the Civil War and said, what do y'all need? They said, and I quote, we need homes and the ground beneath them so that we can plant fruit trees and say to our children, these are yours. Uh, they came up with the idea of 40 acres and a mule. It was never given, you know, politics. And so for a whole generation, people saved their Sunday money, you know, working two, three, four jobs and purchased 16 million acres of land by 1910. Really, really astounding feat. It, it represented 14% of the nation's farm. What do you think happens to the plantation owners if black people stop being sharecroppers and start having their own farm? It's not a trick question. There's no one to work, right? It was a big threat. There's no one to work. Um, and so the backlash was really severe. The peak of black land ownership in this country was 1910. The peak of lynchings in this country was 1910. So you had the white caps formed. Uh, later, the Ku Klux Klan, followed by the White Citizens Council. These are domestic terrorism organizations that threatened, murdered, and destroyed the property of black landowners in an effort to scare them back into sharecropping or to scare them out of town. Um, they killed 4,500 people, um, including David Walker in Hinkman, Kentucky in 1908, who died along with his six children, his wife, his baby, trying to defend their two-acre farm. Um, that land and, and most of these parcels were simply folded into the deed of a white neighbor and then passed down in that way. So if you learned about the Great Migration at all in school, which I didn't, um, and, you know, it's taught as the seeking of opportunity in the North. You know, the factories in World War I and World War II needed labor and so forth, but nobody talks about it as the refugee crisis that it was. I mean, what would you do if people were burning down your house and shooting at your family and you know, get, get out, get out. And so six million people fled to the north. And as a result, again, there's a labor shortage. And the U.S. still hadn't reckoned with its DNA of the food system being stolen land and stolen labor and tried to figure out which population do we exploit next. Um, so at the same time as progressivism was really, for the first time, reaching into the sphere of labor. You know, we had Social Security, we had the eight-hour workday, um, in the 1930s. We had um, ch 
child labor protections, overtime pay, the right to unionize, a whole, a whole slew of laws came about as part of the original New Deal, not like the Green New Deal, but the, the OG New Deal. And um, the Southern Democrats would not vote for these laws if it benefited people of color. And you can read the committee reports. They, they had a lock, and they, they, would, they would not vote for this legislation. And so FDR made compromises and excluded farm workers and domestic workers from this whole Green New Deal, from the whole New Deal package, right? And what that meant is that at this time when the U.S. was reaching out to find new populations of, of workers on the land, that they were not protected by the same labor laws as other Americans. Does anyone know, after uh, black folks started leaving the South, who did the work? Braceros, yeah, exactly. So guest workers. First it was the Filipino workers, then the Chinese workers, then the Mexican workers, Caribbean workers, Jamaican, so forth, right? Um, the idea is that uh, special visas are created. Today it's called the H-2A visa that allows a person to come in on contract to work for a particular farm. Um, the challenge is that because you're here contracted to a particular farm, you're deported if you um, attempt to work somewhere else, if you complain too loud, you piss off your employer, if you report wage theft, if you report sexual harassment or assault, you're very, very likely to lose your job and be sent back. Um, a friend of mine works at an ag university out in the Midwest. And he had a classroom like this full of aspiring farmers. Um, and he asked them, how much would you need to be paid on an hourly basis to work on the meat in the meatpacking plant in this town? So I'll ask you, I'm just curious, what would, what would be your hourly wage requirement to work in a meatpacking plant? Killing, quartering, and packing um, pigs. Who would do it for $20 an hour? 30, 50, 50. okay, 50. Like some trust funds in here, okay? I'm like, I'll do it. <laughs> I don't need that job. Um, a hundred percent of his students said there's no amount of money you can pay me to work in the meatpacking plant. It's disgusting work. It's dangerous work. You're very likely to lose a limb. Um, if not, repetitive stress and arthritis are almost definite. The smell never comes out of your clothes, never comes out of your hair. And they said, emphasize that's Mexican work. That's what they said which I think we can shake our heads at, but like fundamentally, you know, 85% of the actual labor to produce our food is done by Spanish as first language farm workers, most who are born outside of the so-called boundaries. And so we've created a food system that relies on creating such oppressive conditions for indigenous people abroad that they'll leave the land that they own and the families that they love to cross a dangerous border into a hostile country to do work that we wouldn't do for $50 an hour. Like the food system fundamentally relies on that level of exploitation of indigenous people. So that's something that I, that keeps me up at night, something that I think about a lot. You know, of course, not all the black farmers left the South. A lot of us stayed, my grandparents stayed. Um, but they had to confront another challenge, which was the federal government itself. Does anyone know what the USDA stands for? Yes, and their job is to support farmers um, by providing uh, crop insurance, loans, crop allotments, uh, technical assistance, and so forth. This is, these are entitlement programs. All the farmers in the United States are supposed to be able to get them. You go down to Farmers Home Administration, now the FSA. You file your application. You get support. You get your high tunnel, your irrigation, what, whatnot. But black farmers weren't getting this support. White farmers were, black farmers were not. They would go and they were told, come back tomorrow, come back next year, we don't have any funds. And starting in the 1950s and 60s, they were told, did I see you down at the county courthouse trying to register to vote, Farmer Brown? Well, we can't help you today, right? Did I, did I hear that you were at the NAACP meeting last week? Well, why don't you get out of my office right now? Right, so these programs became weapons sharpened to punish civil rights activity. Black farmers filed a class action lawsuit against the federal government that was settled in 1999. It was the largest civil rights settlement in the history of the United States, the Pigford v. Glickman case. And while most of those farmers were now in their 90s, and a $50,000 each settlement is not enough to get you back your land, 
it was an important symbolic victory because what it said is that the reason that black farmers declined from 14% to around 1% of the nation's farmers was not because we didn't know how to farm, we didn't want to farm. It was because society, you know, the government, these terrorist groups were pushing um, black farmers off of their land. And then, then folks, of course, went to the north, mostly the cities, Pittsburgh, Boston, Philly, you know, so forth. And racism is a little different up here. You know, we still want land and homes. Everyone still wants land and homes, but it's trickier, right? Has anyone ever gone on Zillow.com? Okay, so I went on Zillow the other day, and literally certain neighborhoods, specifically the neighborhoods that our farm delivers food to, were outlined in red. Now, why did my jaw drop all the way down to my chest to see in 2019 that the neighborhoods where I deliver food are outlined in red? Because in 1977, that was supposed to become illegal. In 1935 was the beginning of redlining. That's when the federal government commissioned these maps to be made of urban neighborhoods that ranked them from most uh, desirable to lend to to least desirable to lend to, and black and brown neighborhoods were outlined in red as do not lend. So banks did not provide mortgages to black and brown families to buy their own homes and gardens and businesses and to, and to fundamentally participate and get their slice of the American dream. And this has grave consequences because 80% of wealth is inherited. Almost all of that is property, right? So when a white baby is born in this country today, they are born on average 16 times wealthier than a black baby today. And it's not because they were like working really hard in the womb to earn, right? <laughs> to earn all that wealth. It's because of inheritance. So if you never were able to own property, own your home, pass anything down to your children, have that security, right? Have the good schools that come from the good tax base and so forth, you're fundamentally widening that wealth gap. And um, your zip code today is your biggest determiner of your life expectancy. So here we are, 2019. Where do you think this beautiful young person is? Food bank. One in three black children rely on emergency food in order to meet their basic caloric intake for the day, right? Black and brown people are more likely to suffer from diabetes, heart disease, poor eyesight, ADHD, learning disabilities, depression. All of these are connected to not having access to whole food, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, and cultural foods, foods that your great-grandmother would recognize, foods that are prepared around a table. Right? So it impacts everyone. Uh, from the farmer to the consumer. Right now in this country today, as I mentioned, 85% of our food is grown by people who you know, speak Spanish as their first language, identify as Latina or, or Hispanic, and less than 3% of farms are managed by this population. Farming, uh, the way the USDA talks about it, is actually when you own and manage your farm. Farming is the whitest profession. Farm labor is the brownest profession. Veterinarians on alternating day, uh, years are the whitest profession. So I checked the, the stats. Last year was veterinarians, this year was farmers. Um, and currently, 98% of the arable land in this country is owned by white people, which is actually more racially skewed than ever before in history. So it's not getting better, you know, even as it might feel that our ideals are getting more progressive and our laws are, are getting more expansive. When you look at actual wealth, like who controls the land, who controls the wealth. Um, there's more racial disparity than ever before. And I believe that the way we treat each other is reflected in the way we treat the earth. And so um, if you haven't read the recent IPCC climate report on land, definitely check it out. It's dense, but it's worth reading. And re-emphasizes the fact that agriculture is a primary driver of climate change, of land use conversions, of water withdrawals. And so, um, it's not that we don't know how to farm in a way that takes care of the earth, but we've just forgotten about those seeds in the hair. You know, just thrown them and cast them to the side, and that's what we need to pick up. So I'm going to tell you how we're picking up those seeds and planting them, but first I want to give you a moment to just talk to each other. It's not a marriage. It's only like three minutes. Um, find a partner. I will time it, and I would love you to reflect on these questions. Where were your ancestors in this history, and how are your people connected to these events? Find a partner. Don't be shy. Don't leave.
You say free the land, free the people. When I say free the people, you say free the land, free the people. When I say free the people, you say free the land, free the people. Free the people by any means necessary. Um, that comes from the Malcolm X grassroots movement. So thank you for the call and response moment. So we have two brave souls who are willing to share out something that was alive in your conversation. With consent of your partner, of course. Anybody want to share? There's no right answer. We have one member of our conversation from Iran reflecting on whether there was slavery at the time, which is the country of which the topic is the U.S. had a slavery. One person from the Jewish tradition not talking about access to slavery in that. And then myself, where I've got ancestors who were free holders. I don't know if folks have, thank you for sharing that. If you haven't listened to the 1619 podcast or read that insert, it's been really powerful to see come to light the conversations from the anti-colonization movement where black people were like, got together in a church in Philadelphia and were just like, our ancestors' bones are here. Our blood is here. This is our country now. Our nation was forged in that ship. Um, and this is our place. And it's been really powerful to read that, and I appreciate you bringing that to light because, um, yeah, there's a lot to say about that, but thank you. Thank you. One more person want to share? Okay. <laughs> Did you want to say something? You look like you had a little hand. We're going to talk a little bit about picking up some seeds, because the good news is that in every generation, there's been what I like to call rememberers, people who knew that their great-great-great-grandmothers left something for them, took it, considered it, planted it, and passed it on. And at Soul Fire Farm, we do our best to be part of that legacy of rememberers. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer said a lot of things, but one of the things she said was, If you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, nobody can push you around or tell you what to do, which I love. Because the inverse of that, right, is that if you don't have anything canned for the winter and they put some chains around the grocery store, you're going to put down that NAACP membership card. You put down the ballot, right, because who's going to let their children starve? Um, So fundamentally, freedom is intertwined with food sovereignty. And so we formed Soul Fire Farms with particularly a food sovereignty mission. 
uh, which we try to accomplish in three basic ways. One is by literally having a farm that feeds the community, which I know sounds obvious, but there's a lot of like Twitter farms these days, or like theoretical farms. It's like, do you have dirt in the creases of your hands? Then you're not a farmer, right? And so, so actual farming, see those boots, right? Um, training programs for black and brown, uh, aspiring farmer activists, as well as organizing work to fundamentally change the system. So I'll talk a little bit about each of the things we do and how we're building on that legacy of the seed keepers. So the first thing, as I mentioned, is to actually feed the people. What we do is, um, you know, grow. We have 80 acres of land. We cultivate about seven. So we grow vegetables. We raise uh, poultry for eggs and meat, medicines, value-add products, forest products. All that stuff gets boxed up every week and brought to the doorsteps of the people um, in the surrounding cities who need it the most. Uh, we have a sliding scale program with, you know, about half the people middle income, half the people low income, and so folks with more means subsidize the shares of folks with less means. And anyone who is a refugee in our community or is coming back from home from prison is going to get a free share that their neighbors pay for. We call it our solidarity share program. And we're going to feature, you know, culturally relevant, culturally appropriate food in all of that. It's just a picture of one of our boxes. And something I really love about this is, you know, we, we don't have a lot of money <laughs> as farmers, and so we had to buy that land that's like way, way out and rocky and cold. And, you know, all the farmers who had the nice valley soils were shaking their heads at us like, you can't farm up there. What are you talking about? And I was like, yes, we can farm up there. Look at this beautiful food. And so these regenerative practices, these Afro-Indigenous practices, really do a lot in order to uh, bring the soil back. But of course, we didn't make up the idea of feeding our community. There are other seed bearers who kept that alive. And these are some of them. Does anyone know who this is? Black Panthers. Okay. So yes, armed self-defense, right? Yes, 10-point platform. But most of what the Black Panthers was doing was what they called their survival program. Breakfast for 20,000 children in Oakland every morning, right? Bringing elders to, to free clinics providing groceries, providing rides for people to visit their incarcerated loved ones. And this became the basis for the, the breakfast program in schools. That's so fundamental to learning outcomes. Came out of the Black Panthers. So all this food we grow, as I mentioned, we, we use regenerative methods. Cleopatra's worms, the Obama people's raised beds, the Jaden Laku of Haiti, the intercropping. You know, and what we've seen is that we're actually making the earth better. Right? Like Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about, if you haven't read her book, read it. Um, but people aren't necessarily a cancer on the earth. You actually can improve ecosystems as human beings. And we've seen the topsoil increase. We've seen that carbon get trapped back in the soil where it belongs. Um, Europeans removed half of the carbon from the soil in one generation of tillage. And we have, on our farm, and many farms like ours, put that back to its indigenous levels. Our buildings, too, are made of the, you know, the clay and the straw and the sand of the earth, and our cluster developed to leave lots of space for the bears and coyotes. But we didn't come up with this either, this regenerative way of being. Here's some seed bearers that, that we learned from. Does anyone know who this is right here? George Washington Carver. If you go down any hallway during Black History Month in an elementary school, you will see Dr. Carver with like a peanut like right next to him. <laughs> But do you know why he was so into the peanut? What family is it in? Legumes. Legumes are the best friend makers in the whole plant kingdom. They literally are like, hey, rhizobial bacteria, I want to be your friend, so I'm going to make a little house in my root for you and fill it with sugar, and it will be warm and have the right mix of gases. And if you move in, all you need to do is suck in that atmospheric nitrogen make it into organic form so that I can suck it in, and then we'll be friends for life. And they were doing that for thousands of years, which is why there's nitrogen in the soil, right? And so Dr. Carver knew that, and so he convinced farmers, against their better judgment in some ways, to like let their land rest by planting leguminous cover crops and composting and sheet mulching so that those depleted soils would come back. He was the father of organic agriculture in the United States. Late 1800s, a generation before Rodale, was teaching organic farming at Tuskegee University. Right. Also at Tuskegee, Booker T. Watley. Anyone ever um, heard of like Farm to Table? Okay, it's very popular, right? People thought he was nuts too. 60s and 70s, he was like, you know what? Instead of growing food to sell to a wholesaler, here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to get city folks who are yearning for the country to come out to our farms and harvest. And they'll pay us for the privilege of harvesting the crops. We'll make a newsletter so they feel connected to the farm. We'll give them cheaper prices and call them members of our farm, right? The CSA, pick your own. Like, all that stuff comes out of his marketing strategies. And now it's probably, if you're getting into farming, like, that's the way to go, right? I mean, which farmer doesn't have a newsletter? So we thank Booker C. Watley. But perhaps even more important than all of this is the spiritual dimension of how we farm. Right? When I was living in Ghana, um, training with farmers, studying with spiritual elders, the, the queen mothers who were, there's a lot to say about them, but they were the ones who like took care of the orphans, did all the rites of passage, mediated conflict, they did a lot of things. Um, and they had a fun game they liked to play with me <coughs> where they would ask me questions about life in America. They thought we were very strange. So one of these days, the question was, Amidede, is it true, you know, that in the United States, a farmer will plant a seed in the ground and they won't sing or pray or pour libation or even say thank you to the earth and expect the seed to grow? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. And they said, that's why y'all sick. <laughs> y'all sick because you treat the earth like a commodity, like a material thing from which you can extract without limit and not as a living, breathing, spiritual entity deserving of consent and reciprocity that she is. So we might look a little silly here, but we keep our festivals, we make our offerings, we ask the land for consent, we use divination to see if the land consents, um, which is fundamentally part of the African cosmology of how we, we interact with land. So the two more things we're up to, in brief, because I'll leave time for questions, is, uh, is training. You know, it's really, really hard for black indigenous people of color to access ag universities to access incubator programs. We run into all types of, of blockages as far as finances and racism and so forth. And so we started our own training program. And I didn't know if anyone really wanted to farm. Like, I was that weird kid that hugged trees. And, you know, I didn't know if anyone was trying to get down with this stuff. But I will tell you that our program filled up as soon as we put them out and that we have a multi-year waiting list of people who want to come learn how to farm at Soul Fire. Um, we offer programs in Spanish to make sure that we're centering our farm worker community. And almost all of our graduates are doing super amazing things, like running urban farms and rural farms and training farmers how to go organic and you know, providing CSAs for their community and so forth. And that's a real success. We're not trying to get bigger in order to accommodate that waiting list. We really want to make sure that there are so many like super beautiful black and brown led projects that you wouldn't even think to invite us to speak at Tufts because it's just like the way it is. It's the obvious, <laughs> obvious been done thing, right? <laughs> and we work with the babies too. We have a lot, we have thousands of youth who come through, but this, these particular youth is our cohort of 20 that we've been working with for three years. We got one more year um, with them and they're kind of like the black and brown future farmers of America. And they, they learned, in this picture, you see them with their ancestor staff, because they learned that any time they need to make a major decision, they need to go consult their ancestors to see what those instructions are. And so they're, they're getting a spiritual training as well as the, you know, cation exchange capacity and soil macronutrients kind of training. But of course, we didn't make up that idea either of having a farm where people can come that's a safe haven where, you know, we grow food and we, and we teach one another. These are, these are the seed bearers. Does anyone know these folks? Penny Hamer, Shirley and Charles Sherrod, um, Colored Farmers Alliance. So Shirley and Charles Sherrod started the first ever community land trust in the United States in the 1960s. Um, community land trusts, as I'm sure you know, are when um, a community-controlled board owns the land together, and then families are able to build their homes and build equity in their homes. Um, it's fundamentally an indigenous land tenure system that's you know, switched around to fit white men's law. And so they, they started one and they owned 6,000 acres in Georgia together with 500 black families. Really, really incredible feat and, and catalyzed the land trust movement. Fannie Lou Hamer didn't just talk about gumbo soup. She brought together 70 sharecroppers who've been kicked off of their farms for attempting to register to vote and formed an intentional community that provided vegetables and livestock and scholarships um, out to the community. So we, we stand on their legacy. And the final thing that we're up to is, you know, rabble rousing. Y'all, this picture is a little obscure. You probably won't get this one, but I'm curious if anyone knows. I'll make it easier. 
Um, if you went down to register voters in the 1960s, where would you stay? The land of black farmers. That's where you would stay. All of you. That's where you would stay. There's no uh, restaurant that's going to feed you, no hotel that's going to put you up down there, coming from the north to uh, you know, change the status quo. So black farmers pooled their resources. They hosted the activists. They provided um, armed defense for activists. They leveraged their land as collateral for bail money to get activists out of jail. The meeting space was provided, and they would disguise the meetings as Bible studies, so the pamphlets were hidden in Bibles in case anyone peeked in. They had a watch out, so if night riders came through, they would cut a tree down across the road to give you time to escape. There would be no civil rights movement without landowning black farmers. Right? And so some of my mentors who, who were there were like, Oh, it's cute. Y'all grow carrots on your farm and have youth programs? <laughs> like, how are you supporting the movement, right? And so we started to amp it up a little bit, um, got involved with starting this um, national reparations project that's encouraging people to directly donate land and resources to black and indigenous farmers. You can find it on our website. We've had over 20 people get land through this project. It's now turned into its own um, organization that we're incubating called the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust which will make it very easy for folks to make a tax-deductible return of land, which will then be redistributed to indigenous and black communities. Um, started a 30-person griot collective because we realized the power of story. It's in conversations like this that new farmers are born, that land is transferred, um, that people decide to take a stand in their institution to you know, make sure that you're buying fair trade products. And so uh, we have 30 people who go around and talk, and that's pretty fun. And we do international work. We have sibling farms in Vieques, in Haiti, in Ghana. And it's really about making sure that there's an exchange, an intercambio of ideas among peasant farmers who know the land most intimately, who can predict what climate change will do most accurately, and to make sure that these farmers have the support they need for their own sovereignty. And we're in on those conversations about what the Green New Deal will look like. Um, conversations about what Elizabeth Warren's policy on farming will look like, and so just making sure that we take the voices of the farmers that we're close to and, and get them up to people who make decisions. We didn't come up with that idea either. Who are these rabble-rousers upon whose legacy we build? Yeah. Exactly. Chavez, Huerta, Larry Isleyang, who brought the grape industry to its knees. Um, back in the 1960s in order to fight for farm worker rights. The Immokalee workers who broke up a literal slavery ring in 1999 in Florida amongst tomato pickers and so forth. Folks like the Haitian peasant movement who burn Monsanto seed when it comes into port because they know it will displace native seed and so forth. So there's a whole lot that you can do to get involved, as you can imagine. Um, and the good news is you don't have to make any of it up. Because who are the experts in racism in the food system? All right, I'll make it easier. Who are the experts when it comes to understanding what veterans who are struggling with PTSD need? Veterans. Who are the experts when we talk about Islamophobia and how to stop that? Muslims. Who are the experts when it comes to racism in the food system? Black and brown people in the food system, right? So. Um, we work with a bunch of national coalitions and we put together action steps for society to end racism in the food system. And there's everything from like purchasing guidelines to laws that need to change to ways that funders can think about um, interrupting the nonprofit industrial complex but really supports people on the front lines. And so definitely check it out. There's like something for everyone who eats and lives on land to contribute to. And just to super underscore the fact that there really are you know, black and brown people doing amazing things to change the food system, oftentimes not funded, not supported, not given any notoriety. just want to give some shout outs to some of my mentors, like Mama Gail, Mama Karen, Baba Malik, some of the organizations that have, have helped put together this platform, like SAFON and the Black Belt Justice Center and the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, and hundreds and hundreds of others that, you know, are listed out in our action steps that definitely deserve volunteers, donations, support, media attention, all of that. So I want to end with my favorite poem, uh, which is even more powerful today because the person who wrote it just entered the ancestor realm this year. And I wonder if my family can help me read it. Come on.
Come on up. Come on up. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take turns reading a line. So I'll read a line, and then you read, like, or a stanza, and you read a stanza. Back and forth. Here we go. See? See what you can do? Never mind, you can't tell one letter from another. Never mind, you born a slave. Never mind, you lose your name. Never mind, your daddy dead. Never mind, nothing. Here, this here is what a person can do if they put their minds to it and their back in it. Stop sniveling, the land said. Stop picking around the edges of the world. Take advantage, and if you can't take advantage, take disadvantage. We live here on this planet, in this nation, in this country, right here, nowhere else. We got a home in this rock, don't you see? Nobody starving in my home, nobody crying in my home, and if I got a home, you got one too. Grab it. Grab this land. Take it, hold it, my brothers, make it, my sisters, shake it, my siblings, squeeze it, turn it, twist it, beat it, kick it. Kiss it, whip it, stump it, dig it, plow it, seed it, reap it, rent it, buy it, sell it, own it, build it, multiply it, and pass it on. Can you hear me? Pass it on. Thank you. Um, a few minutes for questions. Um, Hollis and I will uh, move the mic around and um, we'll wait to be. Hi, Leah. Thanks for that. Um, my name is Danny. I am on the BIPOC fire waiting list. So, just a shout out to anyone else who might be waiting. I'm trying to make it a one-year list, not a two-year list, so um, thank you. So uh, I'm in the community at large, not a part of Tufts, but I thought that you were going to be here, so I snuck in. Um, and I, um, um, so Soulfire was one of the first uh, organizations, entities, things on Instagram that I saw say BIPOC, um, and it, it was never really a part of my sort of like thought thinking. I understood black, I understood brown, I understood people of color, but the I was a really interesting bridge for me, and I was just thinking about Toni Morrison before you read that poem, because one of my favorite parts of Beloved is where she talks about um, Paul D. getting free, breaking out of that slave camp, and then the indigenous people like taking the free, the escaped slaves and helping them get free. So what I'd love to hear you talk about, especially in the spirit of um, our dearly beloved past, uh, Toni Morrison, I'd love to hear more about how the indigeneity, the indigenous thing, fits in your thinking and in the history of what you're sharing with us. Thanks. Wow, that's really, thank you. I mean, here's the thing, right? One of the projects of settler colonialism has been a divide and conquer project. And so there are ways that between the black community and, indig and the indigenous community, we've been set up against each other. You know, one of the ways you could earn your freedom in the 1800s as a black person was to become a Buffalo soldier and go open the frontier, which means kill indigenous people, right? Um, the Cherokee were encouraged to hold black slaves, um, and then after the Trail of Tears to reject them as part of the Cherokee community. Um, here in the Northeast, my understanding is limited, but something that I've been told is that um, after almost all of the indigenous black men were slaughtered, uh, indigenous women could not marry white people, but they could marry black people, but then they'd lose their land claims because black people could not own land. And so there's all of these projects, right, to divide us. And I, and I find, honestly, when I'm rocking with indigenous folks, a lot of anti-blackness. When I'm rocking with black folks, a lot of anti-indigeneity, or like mythologies that black people were everywhere on the, all the continents since the beginning and don't need to like pay any heed. And I think all of that is, is really problematic. And one of, part of my mission in this lifetime is to try to 
really build true solidarity and understanding between our communities because I think we are natural allies, the folks who were stolen from land and the folks whose land was stolen from them working together. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard though. I don't wanna, I don't wanna sugarcoat it. I think it's really hard and I think we have a lot to learn from each other. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey. Uh, hey, I also snuck in. Um, <laughs> When I was um, even younger than I am now, I used to draw this chart in my head of like, okay, the, the, what, am, what am I doing with my life? It's, it's the important things. There's environmental, and then there's there's racial justice. I don't know where I'm gonna, but I got you know because environmental and every all the activism that I saw was really white, um, and then racial justice important to me for reasons that are both you know just how I walk through the world, but also inheritance and people in my family influencing me, but it was always a separation. Um, and then I found out about, well, it was, it was the Black Panther programs first, and then Mary Lou Hamer, and then fast forward a bit, it was actually used to Fire Farm, um, and it felt like there was this way to, to unify these two threads, and I'm wondering why it's so hard to have a consciousness of that sort of in the in the in the general air or whatever, or why it takes so long to kind of arrive there, and yeah, what you do in your your storytelling practice to achieve that. Wow, that's deep. I was I'm with you on that. I almost quit farming because I thought I was betraying my people. So um, there's a lot to say, but I'll just share one thing, which is that uh, Chris Holden Newsom says the land was the scene of the crime. But I would add, she was never the criminal. So even though slavery and sharecropping and all of that really harmful oppression took place on land, the land is actually what sustained us and kept us going. So when we fled the red clays of Georgia to the paved streets of the urban north, we left behind a little piece of our culture, our souls, our belonging, our source of wisdom. And I think our generation, the returning generation, is realizing that that gaping hole of like something's missing and I can't quite name it, is actually our relationship with the earth. And to reclaim it, we have to be able to reach back beyond the hundreds of years of oppression to the thousands of years of noble, dignified relationship with land and connect our story there with the seeds and the hair, right? In order for that to be dignified and not like feeling like that's returning us to some type of oppression. Um, we're at the end of our time. Um, but if there was one burning question. It's technically 112. <laughs> yes, yes. Good to see you. Thank you for coming to speak with us. Um, and <clears throat> it was a wonderful presentation. I think in this space, we have so much work to do around um, building community, around like coming from our various backgrounds and saying, okay, this is our shared history. How do we be authentic with each other? I'm a part of the Food Justice League and it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle to feel support. It's been a struggle to like have a certain level of backing seemingly, like it's there, there's a facade, but it's just, it doesn't feel solid. It doesn't really feel concrete. And so, at this stage, when you're in this environment that we're all saying we're moving together, but you feel that you have a different level of, you know, you just have a bit more at stake, maybe. Mm -hmm. You have different things at stake, and it's not felt. So how do you, how do you move past that? How do you continue to develop, to develop your vision to ensure that, you know, you can keep moving forward and then you can identify other people that are just as passionate as you are and, and willing to collaborate and, and really willing to transform. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like there's layers to that question. I'd love to hear more. Um, but I think, you know, one of my mentors, Baba Ed Whitfield, talks about, like, it's time to do for ourselves. And so I think the communities who do have a most at stake and are most impacted 
need to come together and figure out our priorities, our priorities together, and just start. And that's when it's then time to garner the support from allies and, and accomplices and co-conspirators. Um, but, but the fundamental work is for us to come together. And so if you're not already connected to like National Black Food and Justice Alliance, you are. Um, I think that's where, you know, the core of the work and that's where we fortify ourselves and then the support will come. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.